Hello and welcome back to Midsummer Night's Dream lectures. Uh, uh, more contextualized readings, I think, than lectures. But in uh, my reading of Act Three, I got a little bit into psychoanalytic theory, and I was arguing um, a little bit more from my own personal sort of interpretive perspective that by looking at psychoanalysis and um, a little bit into Sigmund Freud and Totem and Taboo, um, we can signal a shift in the ways of reading and thinking about things um, that happens in the late 19th and early 20th century and that informs us today in the 21st century. And so my r rationale, of course, by using psychoanalysis um, uh, partly was that, yes, the language of psychoanalysis still helps us to interpret some things going on at various levels of literature, but also that it allows us to see uh, a little bit more of a historical distinction between our time and Shakespeare's time, and particularly this language of development that shows up throughout the 19th century. And uh, I have characterized this as the Euro-Christian imaginary in my earlier lecture. Um, and we don't want to necessarily impose that later development language back on to Shakespeare himself. Now, um, what we'll see at the end, and what I what came up what came up in an earlier lecture was um, Thomas Nash's Terrors of the Night, a book about dreams that happens to um, be released uh, around the same time that Shakespeare's writing A Midsummer Night's Dream, uh, and so. Uh, my use of Freud, who famously wrote on dreams and psychoanalysis um, just at the turn of the 19th and 20th centuries, um, uh, was certainly not the first person to do so, right? <laughs> and Thomas Nash, um, we know, as I read from Nash's Terrors of the Night's book, um, uh, that we um, he was already sort of historicizing the distinction between dreams and the Christian era. And that is uh, the one of the ways that he was distinguishing was through um, changes in fairy folk and hobgoblins and the notions of these figures like um, Puck or um, Robin Goodfellow, um, who of course is a character in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Um, uh, so I'm going to go through uh, Acts 4 and 5 in this lecture because they're fairly short and that'll end my Midsummer Night's Dream lectures. I'll be maneuvering on from this to do Hamlet and to uh, Richard II and uh, The Tempest this summer. Um, I have some other lectures on Macbeth from last summer that people can check out if they find these useful. Um, it's This is primarily for a university level class on Shakespeare that um, uh, where I'm assuming that some students um, are coming to Shakespeare fairly new, but that students in general are, are, are rather advanced students in terms of literature and um, literary theory. And some students are even thinking of becoming teachers where they might have to teach Shakespeare. So uh, that that's kind of what's going on in my mind as I'm formulating these talks that I'm giving. So let's jump back into the beginning of the play here um, at the beginning of uh, Act 4. And the Act 4 opens with um, Titania and Bottom, um, and uh, Bottom is putting on airs here of a gentleman commanding fairies to do various chores. At the end of Act 3, we already saw that Oberon and um, Robin are starting to correct things for the four lovers um, who've been um, chasing each other, um, having all sorts of inversions throughout the night. Um, and so we get this little glimpse um, of, of, a, of a sweet kind of situation between Titania and Bottom, um, who, um, uh, uh, and, and perhaps I think, you know, in my earlier lecture, I mentioned um, Aristotle's terms from tragedy, peripatia, which means a reversal of fortune. We see that a lot in the comedy. And I said that um, comedy doesn't have the amount of anagnoresis, which is the reflection on the wrongs or a self-knowledge um, about um, 
uh, what happened. So um, famously in Oedipus, for example, is that moment of recognition where he realizes that he tried to escape his fate and he um, everything that he did to try and escape it only made the fate his fate happen, right? And we don't generally have that in comedy, but there is a little minor, I guess, anagnoresis with Oberon here. When Oberon comes upon um, Titania and Bottom and they're having this kind of sweet exchange, um, uh, Oberon gets kind of sentimental. And this is about act four, um, scene one, around line 45 here. Um, uh, and he says, welcome, good Robin. Um, seest thou this sweet sight? Her dotage now I do begin to pity for meeting her of late behind the wood, seeking sweet favors for this hateful fool. I did upbraid her and fall out with her. For she is hairy, um, she his hairy temples then had rounded with the cornet of fresh and fragrant flowers. So he's got an ass's head and um, flowers around around him. And this is, the, that of course shows up as a famous sort of image from the play. Um, uh, uh, and that same dew, which sometime heat on the buds was wont to swell like round and orient pearls, stood now within the prettiest flower its eyes, like tears, that did their own disgrace bewail. When I had at my pleasure taunted her, and she in mild terms begged my patience, I then did ask of her her changeling child. This is the child from India, right? Um, which straight she gave me and her fairy sent um, to, to bear him to my bower in fairyland. And now that I have the boy so he's like he's gotten what he wanted i will undo this hateful imperfection of her eyes and gentle puck to take this transformed scalp from off the head of the athenian swain that he awakening when he the other do may all to athens back again to repair and think no more of this night's accidents but as the fierce vexation of a dream but w first I will release the fairy queen. And he squeezes on the juice and notice that the lyric, the, the meter changes here. Be as thou wast wont to be, see as thou was wont to see. Um, Dian, um, Dian's bud or Cupid's flower hath such force and blessed power. That incantatory language of magic, right? Now my Titania wake you, my sweet queen. And then she wakes, and um, uh, again. So the the language of sevens that just that back and forth of the versing, um, uh, it, it has been going on throughout the play and the rhyming. This is one of the most metered, the most rhymed plays that Shakespeare um, uh, does um, um, in his career, and it's early on. He's showing through this flourish his ability as a writer he's also looking for patronage at this point in his life or his career oberon over on um uh page uh or sorry x act four scene one around line 94 um again notice the sevens just hear the verse right then my queen in silence sad trip we after night's shade we the globe can compass soon swifter than the wandering moon um and titania echoes him right um come my lord and come my lord and in our flight right <laughs> come my lord and in our flight tell me how it came this night that i sleeping here was found with these mortals on the ground and um uh, then uh, they walk off, they exit, and, and um, there had been this dreamy sound that the wind horns had shown up um, when they are waking up Oberon, or sorry, when they're w waking up uh, um, Titania. Um, uh, and then we get an echo of that, right, when wind horns uh, uh, again sound here in the play um, to wake um, uh, 
the train or or excuse me the wind horns here are, are waking up <laughs> theseus um there's a little bit of dreaminess going on as the squeezy juice happens on titania's eyes but what i was getting at sorry is the wind horns here um they come uh, oberon uses it to wake um theseus um uh, to wake the lovers that theseus and hippolyta are about to find here excuse me uh, getting a little ahead of myself um <clears throat> uh so uh um theseus and hippolyta are on their way to get married here um and uh um they're discussing things and then um they come across the lovers and aegis is there and uh um theseus says isn't this the day that uh, that your daughter Hermia is supposed to give an answer and Theseus says it is um, and so these uh, Theseus says go bid the huntsmen to wake them um, with their horns and so you have the doubling of the horns is what I was getting at the wind horns from the fairies and now we get the huntsmen's horns that wake up the dream the sleeping um, Athenians um, uh, Theseus says, good morrow, friends. St. Valentine's is past. Begin these woods, um, uh, uh, wood birds, but to couple now. And um, in the preceding um, couple of lines, as they come across the lovers, Theseus had said, no doubt they rose up early to observe the rite of May. Um, and so there's this question of like the rite of May, May Day, May, the May pole has shown up. I've mentioned it in earlier lectures. Um, it was definitely something that the Puritan Christians sort of came to revile as signaling pagan ways, even though people still practiced it, even into the new colonies in, in um, North America. And uh, um, uh, and it was practiced again with Native Americans, actually, dances. And that was some of the things that the Puritans got very mad about in some of the colonies. Um, and so uh, um, uh, when Theseus says, good morrow, friends, um, St. Valentine's is past, he's referring back. And there's a note, at least in my version of the text on this. Um, Val he, he's going back to Valentine's Day, which, of course, is in February. And that's when lovers and lovebirds were supposedly sort of starting to get together. Um, and he says, um, uh, St. Valentine's Day is past. Begin these wood birds, but to couple now. And so he's saying it's been so late. Um, and uh, um, so a lot of time shifting going on here, but they're playing, the language is playing with the seasons and with the idea of midsummer. Um, Lysander says, pardon my Lord. And then lovers kneel. I pray you all stand up. I know you are rival enemies. How comes this gentle concord in the world that hatred is so far from jealousy to sleep by hate and fear no enmity? Why, if you were all mad at each other and enemies, how are you guys all sleeping together, says Theseus. And and they can't quite know. They, they're all having these um, kind of dreams. And Aegis here says, enough, enough, my lord, you have enough. I beg the law, the law upon his head. They would have stolen away. They would, Demetrius, um, thereby to have defeated you and me. You of, you of your wife and me of my consent, of my consent that she should be your wife. And Demetrius at this point, because he has, he's changed, and this is one of the interesting things about the end of the play, is that um, the Demetrius's love for um, Helena remains unchanged, right? Um, and so there are different ways you can do is, is it true love or is it the lingering um, uh, potion? that never gets removed from his eyes. And you can just uh, think about, come up with your own interpretation there. But Demetrius of course says, oh no, well I didn't, I uh, yes, I did go off in the woods to chase them, um, uh, but Helena f followed me and then somehow, mad somehow how I came to fall in love with Helen. And um, so on, upon hearing this, Theseus um, uh, tells, uh, uh, Aegis that he's not going to follow the law. He breaks the law. It's a state of exception, if you will. Um, he, Theseus says, fair lovers, you are fortunately met. Of this discourse, we more, we more will hear anon. 
Aegis, I will overbear your will. For in the temple, by and by, with us, these couples shall eternally be knit. So they're off to the temple. They're all going to get married together. Um, and um, Demetrius is in this kind of in-between moment still. And there's some beautiful lines here um, at the end of Act 4. Scene one, Demetrius says, these things seem small and indistinguishable, like far off mountains turned into clouds. He's thinking back on the events of the night um, and, and, and previous to the, their time in the woods. Hermia says, methinks I see these things with parted eye when everything seems double. Helena says, so methinks, and I have found Demetrius like a jewel mine own and not mine own. Again, that this kind of icicle and the kind of playing with parallel phrasing showing up throughout the play. Um, Demetrius says, are you sure that we are awake? It seems to me that yet we sleep, we dream. Do not you think the Duke was here and bid us follow him? Um, yea, and my father, says Hermia, and Hippolyta, and he did bid us to follow to the temple. Why then we are awake, let's follow him. And by the way, let us recount our dreams. And so they're going to go on and they're going to keep talking about what's happened. And they leave, the lovers leave, and Bottom wakes up and says, when my cue comes, call me and I will answer. Um, my next is most fair Pyramus, hey ho, Peter Quince, flute the the bellows mender, snout the tinker, starveling. So he's waking up. He's like, where are my friends, right? Um, uh, um, God's my life, stolen hence, uh, and left me to sleep. I have had a most rare vision. I've had a dream, past the wit of man to say what dream it was. Man is but an ass if he go, go about to expound this dream. Methought I was... There is no man can tell what. Methought I was, and methought I had, but man is but a patched fool if he will offer to say what methought I had. So he's kind of he's like realizing like, oh, I had this dream where I was an ass, but I would make more of an ass of myself if I were to go out and tell people what my dream was. Right? Um, uh, so different interpretation of dreams going on here. The eye of man hath not so had not heard, um, the ear of man hath not seen, man's hand is not able to taste, his tongue to conceive, nor his heart to report what dream what my dream was. I will get Peter Quince to write a ballad of this dream. It shall be called Bottom's Dream, because it hath no bottom, and I will sing it in the latter end of a play before the Duke peradventure to make it the more gracious I shall sing it at her death um, and so he wants to insert his, his own dream or the song of his dream into the play Pyramus and Thisbe that they're supposed to present at the wedding that ends um, sort of uh, uh, act four scene one and we see that Bottom here is philosophizing about dreams, but he's kind of echo echoing perhaps that Thomas Nash book on dreams. And Thomas Nash and some of the other folks had been making fun of Shakespeare. And so Shakespeare seems to lightheartedly be dealing with um, uh, um, the educated uh, uh, critique of the educated folks by making asses of them and putting them into Bottom's shoes. And so uh, it, it seems to be forgiving enough. Um, uh, but uh, um, nevertheless, um, uh, some some poking fun. Um, and so we get a return with the underplot here to um, 4.2, um, and we get Quince's reversal where he says, um, all of a sudden, like, Bottom has become this kind of hero, and they can't find Bottom, and Quince says, um, you've not a man in all of Athens able to discharge anyone but, but he. Um, and so here... I would say that um, Bottom, who's a very lovable character, is foreshadowing um, uh, this character of Falstaff. There are lots of other versions of characters in um, uh, Shakespeare's plays that are where people are kind of a drunk or they're um, uh, they have a kind of uh, um, folkish wit about them. 
um, they seem like they're being made fun of and they're they're foolish, but at the same time, they have these moments where they shine. And that definitely um, uh, shows up in the this famous knight character in the Henry plays of, of Falstaff, um, uh, who was a popular character at the time of the plays. Um, but then Bottom arrives um, and uh, this ends act four. So we enter into act five of the play um, uh, and um, we're back to, um, uh, we're in the, either in the temple or in Athens. Um, it seems like we're in the temple, we're, so we're still a little bit outside of Athens, but we're in a controlled space here, even though the um, fairies had alluded to things being back in Athens. Um, so, and Hippolytus says, um, "'Tis strange, my Theseus, that these lovers speak of." And so they've been listening to the recounting of dreams by the lovers on their way to get married. Um, uh, more strange than true, uh, I never may believe these antique fables, nor these fairy toys. Lovers and madmen have such these seething brains, such shaping fantasies that apprehend more than cool reason ever comprehends. This is Theseus talking, right? Um, that the lunatic, the lover, and the poet all are of imagination all compact. One sees more devils than vast hell can hold. That That is the madman, the lover, all is frantic sees Helen's beauty in the brow of Egypt, the poet's eye in a fine frenzy rolling doth glance from heaven to earth, from earth to heaven. And as imagination bodies forth the forms of things unknown, the poet's pen turns them to shapes and gives them airy, gives to airy nothing a local habitation and a name. And so here again, we've been talking about the ways that the, sh the play stages plays within place, that the way that the play has been talking about the audience relationship, about imagination itself. And now we give, get thesis giving a lecture on um, uh, um, how poets, how artists um, uh, um, distort reality. Um, this is all of the stuff that if we go back to Plato's Republic that um, is is Socrates' worry about allowing poetry and fancifulness and stage it plays into the ideal republic because it um, it distorts reality, um, uh, and so this is the the the, the law maker Theseus right, um, uh, and he said he, he goes on here such tricks hath among hath strong imagination that if it would but but apprehend some joy, it comprehends some bringer of that joy. Or in the night, imagining some fear, how easy is a bush supposed to a bear? And again, I would almost say that, you know, if you want to do more research on it, you might look like, so Bottom had em entered into this space of being Thomas Nash, the critic of dreams. Um, and now we transfer over into a new act. And there's that, there was that reversal between Bottom and, um, Oberon in terms of a sexual partner with Titania and now that's being glossed I think between Bottom and as a philosopher of the dream and uh, Theseus the philosopher of the dream as well and Hippolyta is doesn't I think she's an, still an outsider here I think that it makes sense that she's an Amazon here because she doesn't quite get how imagination works in Athens um, and she says but all the story of the night told over um, and all their minds transfigured so together, more witnesseth than fancies images, and grows to something of great constancy, but howsoever strange and admirable. And so there's this like this kind of great commentary about like through all of these dreams and all these stories, there's something else comes from the imagination and from the retelling of dreams. There is something that 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 happens. Um, and so she's uh, made curious by this, right? Um, and then Theseus uh, um, uh, um, says, uh, so here come the lovers, and he says, here come the lovers, um, full of joy and mirth, joy, gentle friends, joy and fresh days of love. Um, and then we get some exchanges um, with Philostrate about what the entertainment is going to be um, for um, the evening after the wedding here. Um, and uh, 
um, uh, Philostrate says, a play there is, my lord, some ten words long. Um, so Philostrate is kind of playing as the censor here. Um, uh, but and and Theseus says um, uh, that they're going. They'll hear the play even though um, they're not uh, exactly. Philostrate is sort of advising against it, maybe. And um, Theseus says, um, uh, um, "We're going to hear it." But then he starts talking about what a good performance ought to be. And so now we're getting from the king, or the not the king, but the Duke of Athens here. We're getting some more critical commentary from what they expect of plays. Um, uh, so he says, and we will hear it. And Philostrate has says, no, my noble lord, it's not for you. I've heard it over and it is nothing, nothing in the world, unless you can find sport in their intents, extremely stretched and conned with cruel pain to do you service. And Theseus says, I will hear that play. For no, never anything can be amiss when simpleness and duty tender it. Go bring them in and take your places, ladies. And so he's going to let these kind of amateur players who have put this thing together, he's going to hear them anyway. But he's also, you know, as we see, going to kind of make fun of them. Um, and and um, this again, this is part of the comedy. I feel like there's a little bit of like, I don't know. Maybe it's the performer in my myself that um, gets a little bit nervous about the what is about to happen here. Um, so they come in, and Peter Quince um, begins with an opening um, prologue, right? And this is something that Bottom had advised earlier on in the play. So we're seeing Bottom's additions to Peter Quince's play, um, uh, his influence on the director and the playwright. Um, uh, and so the trumpets come and here comes Peter Quince and here comes the prologue um, if we offend it is with our goodwill that you should think we come not to offend but with goodwill to show our simple skill that is the true beginning of our end consider then we come uh, uh, but in despite we do not come as minding to content you our true intent is all for your delight we are not here that you should not here repent you the actors are at hand and by their show you shall know all that you are like to know and this is kind of these complex reversals of language that are showing up um, uh, kind of start sounding like nonsense to <laughs> Theseus and we have to go out and go parse it out and see is Peter Quince really being stupid is he making fun of them there are all sorts of layers um, uh, again if you have a chance to read Thomas Nash's book it's full of this kind these kinds of reversals as well um, so Theseus says uh, um, this fellow doth not stand upon points um, uh, and Lysander says he hath rid his prologue like a rough colt he knows not the stop a good moral my lord it is not enough to speak but to speak true indeed says Hippolyta um, he hath played on this prologue like a child on a recorder a sound but not in government you can't make sense of it and that language about playing on a recorder being played upon shows up in hamlet as well which we're reading next um uh and so then the play starts um and that begins with peter quince telling the plot of the play they so again it's not so much about what happens right but he reminds them of the story of pyramus and thisbe um and then um the play the actual play um, begins um, uh, 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 just before um, Theseus says would you desire lime and hair to speak better and Dimitri says it's the wittiest partition that I've ever heard discourse my lord and then inter then the play starts so they're already kind of like poking fun and like jibing at the play um, and bottom comes in and notice the language and again here here we're going to see Shakespeare sort of mimicking um, worse playwrights than himself in London so now he's situating himself I think a little bit in between the 
educated people who are criticizing him and the other people who might not be as sophisticated at language play as himself. And this is where um, uh, um, we see uh, uh, um, this showing up with the sort of underplot of the play. Um, uh, Pyramus draws near a wall, the wall, and um, the co of course the wall um, is being played by snout, right? So like we have already this, this is like kind of funny. Um, so um, Pyramus draws near the wall in silence. Oh, and it's bottom playing Pyramus. Oh, grim looked night, oh night with hue so black, oh night, whichever art when day is not oh night oh night alack 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 and this kind of repeating of the same lines this is basically showing up when people aren't very good at verses right um if you are into hip-hop or something it's like sometimes used to happen in mc battles when i would go to them and mc battles people are supposed to be kind of going back and kind of making fun of each other but the person who's like a bad mc keeps saying uh, all they can say is like profanity and say something about about someone else's mom or some, they're just not very creative with their word play. And that's exactly what Shakespeare is kind of making fun of here as well. Uh, somebody who can't freestyle, somebody who's, who's a bad MC. Um, um, uh, I fear my Thisbe's promise is forgot and thou, O wall, O sweet, O lovely wall, that stands between her father's ground and mine, thou wall, O wall, O oh, sweet and lovely wall, show me thy chink to blink through my with mine own eyes. And of course, the directions here is that the wall being played by snout is um, uh, he's holding up his hand and that he's he opens it to make a chink. Um, Thanks, courteous wall. Jove shield thee well for this. But what shall I see? No, this be do I see. O wicked wall, through whom I see no bliss. Cursed be thy stones for thus deceiving me. And Theseus says, the wall, methinks, being sensible, should curse again. And Bottom says, breaks the fourth wall here. So we see this comedy just showing up all over the place. Like, um, Bottom, like, hears Theseus, breaks character, and says, No, in truth, sir, he should not. Deceiving me is Thisbe's cue. She is to enter now, and I am to spire through the wall. You shall see it, uh, see it will fall. Um, uh, and so enter, Thisbe enters, Pat, as I told you, yonder she comes. <laughs> and then Flute comes in as Thisbe, right? Oh, wall, full of ha full often hast thou heard my moans for parting my fair Pyramus and me. My cherry lips have often kissed thy stones, thy stones with lime and hair um, knit up in thee. And Bottom says, I see a voice. Now I will to the chink to spy and I can uh, hear my Thisbe's face. Thisbe, and so this kind of mixing up the, of the senses here. And then we get some more isocolon happening, This, but between characters, I mentioned it in my last lecture. Um, bottom says, think, think what thou wilt, I am thy lover's grace, and like uh, Lamander am I trusty still. And I, like Helen, till the fates kill me, says Flute, and Bottom says, uh, no, uh, not she not Shafelis to Procris was so true. All of these references to classical, more classical um, stories that are in Ovid. Um, uh, as as um, Shafelis to Procris, I to you. And that's kind of tit for tat, back and forth, um, a, a parallel structuring going on of Isocolon. Oh, kiss me through the hole of this vile wall. I kiss the wall's hole and not your lips. And of course, this is Snout who's playing the wall, the plays being on the butthole or perhaps a uh, penis hole. <laughs> um, anyway, the holy parts of the body. Um, uh, so this is like uproarious laughter perhaps going on. Um, and then they leave and 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 um, uh, um, Theseus says, now is the more use between the two neighbors. Um, uh, um, and you might think about that if you read Robert Frost's poem on the mending wall. <laughs> there, if there's like some sort of reference on the walls and what makes good neighbors there. Um, uh, um, Demetrius um, uh, says, no remedy, my lord, when walls are so willful to hear without warning. 
And Hippolyta just says, this is the silliest stuff I ever heard. Right? And Theseus says, the best in this kind are but shadows, and the worst are no worse if, imagine, if imagination amend them. It must be your imagination then and not theirs, says Hippolyta. So the, this commentary on the audience's imagination and what's going on on stage. And Theseus, perhaps being a little bit kind here, says, if we imagine no worse of them than they of themselves, they pa may pass for excellent men. Here come two noble beasts and a man and a lion. And earlier, Demetrius had made fun of this and said, well, is the lion going to speak? All of these things, these ways that they're making fun. And Snug comes in and does exactly what Bottom had warned Peter Quince to do earlier in the play and warns the audience of the fact that he's not a real lion, but he's just playing a lion as well, right? So um, this uh, kind of didactic, overly didactic performance um, going on here. Uh, um, uh, and um, then we get Starveling coming in again and does the same thing. He's playing the moon, but he's holding a lantern that um, is supposed to represent the moon. He says, this lantern doth the horned moon present, um, or represent, right? Um, Demetrius says he should have worn horns on his head. And Theseus says he is no crescent and his horns are invisible within the circ circumference. And so they're making fun of how skinny apparently Starveling is and his name is Starveling. Um, uh, so it's like the rich people making fun of the poor um, thin guy as well. So there's this class stuff going on in the background. Um, and we get more and more isocolons back and forth and this flourish of them um, in between characters um, around lines um, to, uh, I don't know, 56 or so. Um, I'll pick up. Um, we're in act, act five, scene one still. Um, Flute says, this old ninny's a tomb. Um, where is my love? Of course, he hasn't corrected from earlier on in the play when Peter Quince corrects him there. Snug says, oh, the lantern and the lantern roars and Thisbe runs off, um, uh, uh, dropping her mantle. Um, well roared, lion. <laughs> well run, Thisbe. Well shown, moon. Truly, the moon shines with a good grace. Well moused, lion. Um, again, that's all this kind of icicle, like, well done, this, the, the, the repeated phrasing. But it because it's going through characters and it amplifies on itself, it's showing um, uh, Shakespeare's skill here. Um, Demetrius, and then came Pyramus. <laughs> and so the lion vanished, says Lysander. So they're just commenting and making fun of the play the whole time. Bottom comes in, and we notice this kind of language. Um, uh, that kind of sounds like limerick-ish. Um, Sweet moon, I thank thee for thy sunny boom beams. I thank thee, moon, for shining now so bright. For by the gracious golden glittering gleams, I trust to take the truest Thisbe sight. But stay, O oh spite, but mark, poor knight, what dreadful dole is here. Eyes, do you see? How can it be? O oh dainty duck, O oh dear. Thy mantle good, what stained with blood. Approach ye furies fell. O fates, come, come, cut thread and thrum. Quail crush, conclude and quell. This is like Shakespeare making fun of people who aren't as good as poetry as himself. Um, uh, and it shows up in the next one. Um, come, come tears, confound, O oh, sword and wound um, uh, that confound and wound this it sounds like a slant to us but probably for shakespeare's audience uh the sound of those vowels are much closer and so that it might not be an off rhyme there um the pap of pyramus i that left pap where heart doth hop um thus die, die i thus 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 and he stabs himself um now am i dead now am i fled my soul is in the sky tongue loose thy light moon take thy flight now die 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 this is like hilarious it's just showing um uh uh the inability of the poet but i would invite you to hear this later on we're not reading king lear this summer um um uh to hear 
the the way that he can do the same thing with a, a, a word like never 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 which gets repeated um uh in a different context and do the same thing and have it be completely profound and this is part of the artistry that makes shakespeare quite the, the genius that he is um uh um uh so uh we've had more isocolons the bad and simple verse um and then uh, the play ends and uh, Theseus says, okay, I don't want to hear anymore. I don't want to hear the prologue. You guys can dance and they, they can leave. And we don't get to hear Bottom's song, unfortunately. Um, uh, just looking to see if I have more on my text here that I want to talk about. Um, the dancers act and, and, and exit here. Um, and Theseus is um uh saying the iron tongue of midnight hath told twelve lovers to bed tis almost fairy time that's when the fairies are going to come out again i fear we shall outsleep the coming morn as much as we this night have overwatched this palpable gross play hath well beguiled the heavy gate of night sweet friends to bed a fortnight hold we this solemnity in nightly revels and new jollity fortnight is two weeks two weeks of partying and having sex in the new marriage beds Ooh, i wish i could take two weeks off every time i went to a wedding <laughs> um so uh then we get the end of uh scene one here everybody's left and robin comes in and this is really interesting because there was no um um uh there was no end right um to uh, no epilogue to um, the play because Theseus says it's time for bed and then we get Robin coming in and of course his typical incantatory verse showing up now the hungry lion roars and the wolf behowls the moon whilst the heavy plowman snores and all with weary task for done now the wasted brands do glow whilst the screech owl screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud now it is the time of night so you can feel that flow feel that incantation contrast it back with the poetry that was happening um in um, peter quince's version of of um pyramus and thisbia or at least peter quince um through the help the editing help of bottom right <laughs> um and uh um that the great so i'm going to continue just with because it sounds so beautiful what, what he's done with robin that the graves all gaping wide every one lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to, to glide and we fairies that do run by the triple hecate's team from the presence of the sun following darkness like a dream now are frolic not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house i'm sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door and you just want to when you're reading over it see the way that shakespeare can carry over the sentence structure but keep this flow going in terms of the verse and the meter um, so beautifully and the rhyme so that you can you, the, the rhyme doesn't feel like it's pounding into your ears um, uh, even with the flow of the meaning of the sentences it's so beautiful <laughs> uh, uh, it just excites me um, and um, uh, Oberon and the other fairies come in and they're going to bless the house and they're blessing it with magic and their language shows the ways that they bless the house with their fairy magic so they start singing this song Oberon says um, now until the break of day through this house each fairy stray to the best bride bed we will we which by us shall blessed be and the issue there create ever shall be fortunate so shall all the couples three ever true and loving be and the blots of nature's hand shall not in their issue stand and so here they're encouraging here come out the fairies in the middle of the night to the marriage beds to encourage not just sex but conception right and the issue there to create ever shall be fortunate right and so i've said that comedy plays are about the production of the new generation of society and that's what shakespeare is showing the fairies come to do even after after they've gone to the temple the fairies come back out and it's there's something about nature 
itself that is the creative principle that's necessary. So think back to Titania's speeches earlier in the play about nature as well. I'm going to continue on until the end here. Never mole, hair slip, nor scar, nor mark prodigious, such as our despised in nativity shall upon their children be. With this field do consecrate every fairy take his gate, and every several chamber bless through this palace with sweet peace. And the owner of it blessed ever shall in safety rest. Trip away, make no stay. Meet me all by break of day the song that they've sung together and then they all leave and then we get another real epilogue here to the play right and again there's a solemnity i feel like, like that's happened in, in the grace by which these lines have come in or the flow i mean grace is kind of a christian concept but so they're these uh um um fairies have come in and and they've they've given us such a different kind of magical flow to language than what we were hearing in the peter quince play and and robin here sit, kind of echoes back to peter quince and says if we shadows have offended think but this and all is mended that you have but slumbered here while these visions did appear and this weak and idle theme no more yielding but a dream so that dream again he reinvokes the dream but who is he talking to he's breaking the fourth wall he's doing exactly what bottom had done earlier in the act um that was so wrong and here we have robin tell talking to us directly as the audience and telling us that if we're offended just think of it as a dream right um, gentles do not reprehend if you pardon we will mend and as i am an honest puck if we have unearned luck now to escape the serpent's tongue we will make amends ere long else the puck a liar call so good night unto you all give me your hands if we be friends and robin shall restore amends and so he reaches out and then of course you know the, the hoping for applause but even in this simple ending which puts an uh, epilogue in even when theseus had, had rejected the epilogue also reaches out directly to the gentles and the audience who've been being made fun of here um, and reaches to everybody and, and says let's just think of this all as a dream and so it becomes a kind of defense of what i think imagination and poetry ought to be doing in society and why we need it why we need the dream space of imagination amid laws amid christianity amid nobility um there needs to be some sort of gel and perhaps art can provide that type of gel across classes we can make satire and make fun of all of ourselves and that might be something that can keep society together seems to be um, at least part of the implicit argument of what's going on here as well i'm going to end there i'll pick up again with hamlet um uh and as i get the lectures prepared for them um, uh, for my students, feel free to reach out with questions, um, and you have the notes in your, uh, uh, in your course shells as well. If you're the general public watching this on YouTube, you can certainly email me and whenever I am available, I might be able to pass on notes if, if you so wish. Um, thank you for your patience. Thank you for listening as always, and, um, I will hope to see you soon. Have a good rest of your day or night, um, wherever you happen to be when you watch this.